This time it's five superbikes of the 70s that had twin cylinder motors. The 1970s was truly the era when the superbike came to the fore. There had been superbikes before, but now there was a plethora of manufacturers building machines that we would definitely categorise as superbikes. So for this video, we're going to look at machines with twin cylinder engines. So here's five superbikes with twin cylinder engines from the 1970s. Moto Guzzi Le Mans 850. The story of the Le Mans really starts with the Tonti framed V7 Sport. This was then followed by the 750S. This machine was a redesign that was slightly cheaper to manufacture and less complex than the original 750 Sport. A prototype for Le Mans was first displayed in 1972, but we actually didn't get a production bike until four years later in 1976. The engine was visually the same as the 750S, being an air cooled 90 degree overhead valve V twin with a camshaft running in the centre of the V and push rods coming up from it. This is then mounted longitudinally through a 5 speed gearbox and by a shaft to the back wheels. Guzzi claimed an 80 horsepower somewhat optimistically. The truth of the back wheel was of course somewhat lower. The top speed was around 123 miles an hour, according to a mid 70s test performed by a superbike magazine in the UK. Many other sources will claim to stay over 130 or 130 miles an hour. But the things that really set the Le Mans apart were its amazing calf racer styling and the Tonti frame, which gave the machine better handling than pretty much any other machine on the road at that time. One slightly surprising aspect of the bike is with all that calf racer, no compromise styling, the gearing is very tall, so actually the more modest touring models can out accelerate the thing, 0-60 at least. The bike famously had all round disc brakes, with a link brake system meaning that the back brake foot pedal operated just the back brake, but also one of the front discs too. And some testers state that they've struggled with this brake system and found it rather weird. I owned a number of bikes with this brake system and actually found it no problem at all. Once you get used to it, you don't even think about it. The late 70s would see the introduction of the Mark II. This had a completely revised set of dials and clocks, completely new bodywork, with leg shells integrated around the engine and a much larger screen with a square headlamp. The Mark III would follow in 81. This had much less bulbous clocks and generally looks more streamlined and more nimble than the earlier Mark II and is a nice return to the naked strip back styling of the earlier model. The Mark III would later be replaced by the Mark IV with its 1000cc engine. But that's really about the 1980s and perhaps as something for another time. The Norton Commando. Norton's twin cylinder engine had started life as a 500 before later being famously installed in the featherbed frame as the Dominator series through 500, 600 and later 650 models. A later 750 model, the Atlas, was plagued by vibration and this would give rise to the development of the Commando. The Commando used isoelastic engine mounts that were intended to tame the vibration from Bert Hopwood's parallel twin. The design of the isoelastic engine mounts in the frame is often attributed to Stefan Bauer, who worked with Rolls Royce. While the Bernard Hooper, former engineer at Villiers, is often said to have in fact designed the commando frame. The machine was first displayed at the Hills Court Show in 1967 and looked very different from the featherbed frame machines that had gone before. The Atlas engine was canted forward, and it and a whole lower subframe was mounted to the main frame of the bike by rather isoelastic mounts. The traditional British overhead valve parallel twin air cooled motor developed a claimed 58 horsepower, although this would of course be at the rear wheel. This is a British company. The power is then fed through a non unit AMC gearbox of four speeds to the back wheel. And as tested by Motorcycle Magazine in 1967, the bike would hit a top speed of 117 miles an hour with a standing quarter mile time of 13.7 seconds, which by 1967 standards was unbelievably fast. However, the later S model of its combat engine would claim 65 horsepower, 
to a slightly high top speed of a standing quarter mile of just around 12.1 seconds. Although unfortunately these days the compact engine is perhaps best known for its mechanical problems rather than its actual mega performance. And the problems caused by the engine would leave Norton in a financial black hole, which would bring about the forced marriage between themselves and the BSA Triumph Group in 1973. And this would lead to the production of the Crime Bear being moved to Wolverhampton later that year. Another change that year was the available, initially as an option, of an 850 engine, actually 823 cc's. The development of the 850 engine had really been keyed by the requirement for a quieter machine in the European market and for, of course, the emission regulations that were then coming into force in America. Both key markets for what was seen by this point as a sports touring mount. The Mark II arrived in 1974 and featured only minor changes, and as with the Mark I, there was a Mark IIa, which featured those quiet homologation exhausts. The Mark III would arrive in 1975. This featured a move of the gear change over to the left side to match the convention at the time, although it's still only a four-speed AMC gearbox. And of course, now there were Lockheed brakes all round. There's even an electric start, although as Keanu Reeves can often testify, because he owns one of these bikes, it doesn't always work when the engine's cold. It's more of a start assist. And the 850's performance was no more than that of the old 750, but it had a lot more torque. And it seemed that now, particularly with the interstate version with its vast tank, the commander would finally become the sports tourer that it always seemed destined to be. Unfortunately, the machine only had two years to live. Financial problems within the company meant that it was all over by 1977. And so it was brought to an end the story of the Norton Commando. Well, for now at least. The Laverda 750 Twins There's no denying that Laverda's big twin motor was very much influenced by the Honda CB77, although of course it's not exactly the same. In 1964, Laverda's general manager, Massimo Laverda, visited the US and when he returned, he persuaded his father Francesco of the need to build a large capacity twin motorcycle. For inspiration, Massimo purchased a Honda CB77, an Norton 650SS and a BMW R69S. And while it's true that elements of all three machines were used in the final design, of course it's the Honda engine design which stands out the most. The company's chief designer, Luciano Zen, designed a 650cc parallel twin which looked admittedly very much like the Honda. This was housed in a spine frame which used the engine as a stress member. A prototype was shown at the Earl's Court Show in 1966. In 67, importer Jack McCormick from America visited the factory and suggested they enlarge the machine up to 750 to better suit it to the US market. And thus, the 750 was created. The first model was the 750 GT. This arrived in 1968 and had a 744cc, 360-degree crank, air-cooled, single-overhead cam engine. In 1969, the GT was joined by the 750S. This had a raised compression engine for higher performance, in fact an extra 8 horsepower, and a strengthened frame. But the S was quite short-lived, being replaced in 1970 by the SF. This stands for Super Freni, or Super Brakes, referring to the massive twin-leading shoe drum brakes of Laverda's own design. 73 would see the arrival of the SF1. This used Nippo Denso speedometer and rev counters instead of the previously used British-made Smith items. There were also larger 36mm carburetors and horsepower now raised to 66 horsepower at 7,300 rpm. The SF2 arrived in 1974 and this replaced the drum brakes with Brembo disc brakes at the front. There was still a drum at the rear however and there was also a left-sided gear change model for the US market from 1975. The last of the sporty models was the SF3 of 1976. This had all-round disc brakes, cast wheels and now had a fiberglass rear cowling over the back seat. And for the more modest touring models, of course, changes were less frenetic. The GT finally being replaced by the GTL in 1974. This had improved braking, some engine improvements and a revision to the chassis. And sensibly the fuel tank was enlarged for greater touring range. Several police forces in Italy would purchase this model and the machine would remain popular before it was phased out in 1977. But perhaps the most famous variant of the 750 was the 750 SFC or, or Super Freni Competizione. This of course was a race model designed to compete in the Bold Door. This hand-built factory racer 
pitted a tuned engine, improved brakes and was of course famous for that bright orange half fairing. Around 549 of these limited production machines would eventually be completed. The BMW R100 RS The BMW R90S had been their first real modern sports tourer with its unique bikini fairing and aggressive styling. And I think many people would have expected the R90S to be included here, but instead have gone for its replacement, the R100 RS. In 1976, BMW replaced their R90S with the larger 1000cc engine. Horsepower had only risen from 67 to a claimed 68, although other sources say 70 horsepower. BMW would claim the top speed of the R100 RS to be around 124 miles an hour, Although in testing by Superbike magazine in the late 70s, they really struggled to get the machine much past 115. And it is possible that very advanced fairing actually may have made the bike a little slower, although it greatly enhanced rider comfort, which of course is what BMW were aiming for in the first place. The BMW R100 RS used an air-cooled boxer twin of 980 cc's, with a bore and stroke of 94 by 70.6. The machine had a compression ratio of 9.5 to 1, and was fed fuel through two big Bing carburetors. The claimed 70 horsepower at 7000 rpm was then fed through a dry single plate clutch via a 5 speed gearbox and onto the back wheel. The bike was quite heavy at 230 kilos or 506 pounds dry, and this did have a negative effect on acceleration with a standard quarter mile time of 13.9 seconds and a terminal velocity of 97.3, so actually slower through the quarter mile than a 10 year old Norton Commando with only 58 horsepower, remember. But the bike's supreme gift was a sports tourer. No other machine at the time could touch it in terms of motorway mile munching. With the only caveats being those narrow bars making the steering heavy, and the seat on some early models being not quite as comfortable as perhaps it should have been. But with this machine, BMW had single-handedly created the sports tourer category, making the machine a true classic of the 1970s. Ducati's 750 and 900 bevel drive V-twins. Think of Ducati today and you think 748-916. These machines originate from a very different family of engines. The early machines owe their existence to the early bevel drive single cylinder machines of the 1960s and 70s. Ducati was founded in Bologna in 1926 and initially it was actually a producer of radios and electronic goods and not motorcycles at all. They didn't produce their first item to do with motorcycling until post-war era when they introduced the Cucciolo in 1950. This was a small engine that could be mounted onto a bicycle frame and this would eventually lead on to the manufacture of complete motorcycles. Ducati would develop a range of single cylinder engines with bevel drive overhead cam top ends and these would form the basis of the later V-twin or as Ducati liked to turn them L-twin engines in the 1970s. With the SS models and their Desmodronic valve gear reviving in 1974 Although in reality, the conventional valve spring engines offer very similar performance, at a lower cost. So it can make a very smart buy for the candy classic enthusiast who doesn't want to pay the eye-watering figures that are now asked for the 750-900 SS models. Ducati's 900 Supersport used an 864cc engine with a boring stroke of 86 by 74.4. There were two desmodronically controlled valves per cylinder and the bike produced around 65 horsepower at the back wheel. And this was said to be enough to push the 225 kilo or 496 pound bike to a top speed of around 130 miles an hour. And the machine was fitted all around disc brakes to help rein in the performance. But for me though, as a kid growing up in the 1970s, the most glamorous air-cooled bevel drive Ducati has to be the Hailwood replica. The machine is of course based on the standard 900, but of course was created to celebrate Mike Hailwood's famous TT victory. Ducati claimed about 80 horsepower at the crank, so that's going to be about on par with a standard bike when it gets to the back wheel. Although for me, given the glamour of this thing, just how fast to go really matter. Oddly enough, the Hellwood replica is not one of the most collectible Ducatis, simply because it's fairly common, relatively speaking. The very early 750 SSs were built in much smaller numbers and now command much higher prices. But for me, I go for the Hellwood rep every time. 
Assuming I could start the thing, of course. It's kickstart only, and a good friend of mine owned one who was about six foot and said it was a pig to start. Still, I'd take the chance. Ducati's bevel drive engine would survive on into the 1980s, but the belt drive Panther would show the way of the future. Cheaper to make and easier to tune, and of course lighter and simpler. That engine would lead Ducati in a whole range of new and very exciting directions. What collections of bikes would you like to see us do a video on? Maybe you've got a bike we can use for a test ride. Either way, get in touch below. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching.